Uh, and we talk about adversarial uh, sequence prediction. Uh, Huter and uh, Leg are doing some interesting work in uh, coming up with mathematical formalisms for defining intelligence uh, and measuring intelligence. And this is closely related to sequence prediction. And uh, Leg has a more, interest, a more recent paper on which asks, is there an elegant universal theory of prediction? And uh, so the situation with, with uh, sequence prediction is here pictured in the, at the top. Uh, we have uh, programs for universal Turing machines. We have two programs here, a generator and a predictor. And the generator generates an infinite binary sequence, and the predictor reads that sequence and tries to predict the next symbol. So after it read first n symbols, it tries to predict the n plus first. And we say that the predictor learns to predict the generator if it only makes a finite number of errors, that at a point in the sequence past which it's always right. And uh, a universal predictor is a single program that can learn to predict any generator. Well, so I wanted to do kind of a takeoff on, on this work of, of, of legs. So uh, there's a couple of, of issues. One is that one of the complexities, and this sequence prediction is related to intelligence, and one of the complexities for an intelligent being in our world is the presence of other intelligent beings. So uh, in other words, you might say the woods have eyes. So we give the generator an eye so that it can see the predictions being made by the predictor. And now it will call it an evader. So now the evader is, at, before it puts out its n first symbol, it looks at the first n predictions from the predictor. And we say that the evader learns to evade if the predictor only gets a finite number right. That is, if there's a point in the sequence past which the predictor is always wrong. So we can sort of see a game between the predictor and the evader. And there's a nice symmetry between uh, predictors and evaders. You can sort of show that um, for any, uh, any evader can be turned into a predictor and vice versa. The rest, will, it's, it's a little too big for the page, but that's weird. So a few definitions here. Well, let's see be the set of all computable binary infinite sequences, that is, the set of all sequences for which there's a generator. And now f is going to be a bound on computing time. It's a function from the integers to the integers. It's increasing. And we'll let C sub f be the subset of those sequences, those binary sequences, who, who can be, which can be generated by generators who's, who generate their nth symbol in computing time bounded by f of n. Then uh, Leg, Leg in his paper concludes that no, there is no universal predictor. Uh, and he uses sort of a girdle-like argument for that. But uh, that the difficulty lies entirely with um, generators who, whose generation takes a lot of computing time. So f here could be anything. It could be Ackerman's function of n comma n, which you know grows very, very fast. And Legs 11.6.2 says, for any f, there is a single predictor that can learn to predict all sequences in uh, C sub f. Uh, now, my result was to, oops, oops, there we go, to, um, to generalize that, huh, really got on here. I got it. Okay, thanks. To uh, generalize that lemma, and there was a there was a slight complication in the in the in extending the proof because now I wasn't dealing with a sequence, but I was dealing with an evader that could react to the prediction. So it, but uh, there is a, there is a predictor that can learn to predict all sequences. It generated by E sub f, where E sub f is the evaders whose computing time is bounded by f. And similar there's an evader that can learn to evade all the predictors in, in P sub f. Of course, the evader that can learn to predict all of P sub f is not in E sub f. Basically, these, they work by simulating all possible opponents. So there's no way that they're going to be in, um, in the... Uh, So at any rate, the gain between predictors and evaders is what you could call a computational resources arms race. That is, if either side can simulate all possible opponents, then it always wins. It learns to predict or learns to evade. However, I mean, there's, some, there's another caveat with all of this work, which is Seth Lloyd estimates, he's a physicist, estimates that the universe contains no more than 10 to the 90th bits and can, can 
have performed no more than 120, 10 to the 120th operations on those bits in its history. In other words, the universe is a finite state machine. So, uh, you know, even for uh, a modest f of n like 2 to the n or any growing n, f of n is eventually going to exceed the total number of computations in the history of the universe. And so, uh, this says that while there's no universal predictor, from a practical point of view, you can predict any sequences that are generated in this universe, uh, but that, um, of course, that predictor can't be implemented in this universe. <laughs> so, so uh, and you know, I, I sort of thought about, well, how can I extend that, this, this theory uh, to the situation? And it's very hard then to extend the, the nice thing about Turing machines is it's easy to prove stuff about Turing machines. It's much harder to make similar proofs in the finite state case. So instead of trying to prove something, I did some software experiments with a table lookup algorithm, playing in the predictor evader game, uh, where the table just sort of remembers game sequences and the table length up to whatever fits in the table length. And the table length is a measure of the computing resources. And then we have an added caveat, which as a predictor and evader play the game at, on each round, on each symbol, whichever one wins gets a little increment in their table length and the other one gets a little decrement in the table length. And, of course, this, these experiments are parameterized with a lot of parameters, but I found that over a fairly broad range of parameters, one side gets and keeps all the resources. Uh, so that suggests that in this case, as in the theoretical case, it's a computational resources arms race, an unstable arms race. So, uh, not uh, being shy about drawing sweeping conclusions from <laughs> modest results, <laughs> We look at AI ethics, <laughs> and uh, I mean, in, in a way, you know, if you look at what's happening in the U.S. economy, there's been increasing income inequality for the last three decades, which corresponds roughly to what we call the information economy. So, as the economy, as computational resources become more and more important in our economy, maybe we're dealing with a computational resources arms race in our economy. Uh, that's, that's, that's leading to this, and, and, it, and if that's the case, then that's a serious issue for AI. For, I mean, obviously we have to worry about the question of AI versus humanity, but I think a, another question we need to worry about is the ability of AI to create an elite, uh, some group of winners who have, who have sort of a dominant set of computational resources <coughs> at the expense of the great mass, and one very prosaic way to look at it is in a market economy, when the computers take all the jobs and nobody can get a job, you know, the efficient market will say, well, what do we do with all these people we don't need to do jobs, you know? And so, um, well, at any rate, that's, that's, that's my talk, I'm sure, as well. <laughs> <laughs>